Welcome to Concordia Church Online. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here. If this is your first time with us, let us know you're here by texting the word NEW to 619-493-4001. We'd love to welcome you personally. We are in a new series called Prayer Conversations with God. If you missed last week's message, you can find it on our Concordia Church YouTube or Facebook channel. Can I ask you a favor? Would you subscribe to our YouTube channel? We want to reach 100 subscribers so that we can personalize the link. That helps people find us. Thank you. Now, let's join in worship together. Hi, my name is Richard. Welcome to Concordia's Classic Worship Online. I want to introduce myself because some of you are watching for the very first time. And that's what you do. You introduce yourself when you meet someone new. So again, thanks for being here today, for being a part of our, our worship. We're going to spend some time in conversation today, uh, talking about how, how prayer works in our lives and how prayer makes a difference in our life with God and in the world. Thanks for being here. Let's worship. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord.
Instill in our hearts the love of your name. Impress on our minds the teachings of your word. And increase in our lives all that is holy and just. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Christians, it's important to remember that our relationship is not just with me and Jesus, not just with me and God, that there are other believers that God calls the body of Christ. Not only do we support each other and care for each other, but we hold a faith in common. Each week we express that faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So why pray? I mean, you watch something like that and you think, well, is, is it like desperation or something? I, I mean, some things are so big, so huge, so the problem's so great and, and all-encompassing that you're like, there's nothing I can do about this, so I guess I'll pray. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus, you pray because you know Jesus and you know how big he is and, and you believe that he's big enough to deal with this huge crisis. If you don't believe in Jesus, you might still pray at, at a time like that because, well, God, if he were to exist, well, he'd be the only one that could handle something this big. And so certainly, I suppose desperation is one of the reasons that people pray. But there's lots of them. I mean, sometimes I think uh, people pray as sort of a religious checklist. It's almost like a duty to perform. Sometimes it's more of habit or tradition or maybe family practice. I know in my, in my family growing up, we always, always, always prayed both before and after every meal. Before the meals, it was, come Lord Jesus, and after it was, oh, give thanks, and if we didn't do that, like if I tried to start eating before, I'd be reminded, no, we pray. And if I tried to get up from the table and go do something, I get, no, 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 we got to pray first. So that's kind of into our fabric as a, as a family. Some people pray just because it's kind of like a good luck charm. And they're like, well, okay, uh, I prayed on it. Hey, got that covered. I'm good. Even if you didn't really do any more than, hey, God, praying about it. Uh, some people, it's more of like insurance. You know, cover all the bases, say, well, I hope I get what I want, or at least I hope I avoid the lightning bolt uh, for not doing something I was supposed to do. Like, you know, there's lots of possibilities, many more than that, but I think mostly it deep down kind of comes down to we pray because we hope it pays. We pray because we hope that it pays. And what I mean by pays is that we get what we want or the other people get what we're praying for or, again, at least we don't get zapped for kind of stepping out of line and missing some religious thing we were supposed to be doing. But 
what if it looks like it doesn't pay? I, I remember reading the story, John DeVries, De uh, he's the founder of Mission India, one of our mission partners uh, with Concordia. And he writes of the time when he was a pastor at a, at a church, and he's been reading about prayer in like places like Korea and how God, amazing things were happening. So he says, we got to do this. So he gathered a group of people, put out a call that says, let's meet at the church every day, every day, 7 o'clock in the morning, and let's pray. Started out with about 50 people, ended up being about 30 to 40 that were relatively consistent. And, and they were getting really excited in the beginning as they were praying because they were praying for things and they were happening. And started documenting all this so, so they could share with the rest of the church and build excitement. One week they had like 49 specific answers that they could document. Oh, we prayed for this and it happened. But then it's like the, the spigot turned off. It's like they were praying and they weren't getting any answers. They were charting nothing. In fact, it seemed that they were praying for things and it's like the opposite was happening. They'd pray for a, a couple with marital problems and instead of getting back together, they'd get a divorce. They, they'd pray for people to be healed and they'd get worse. Some even died. And, and some even in the group started having things happen to them and their families and, and so John writes, and I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget, there was a businessman that was in that prayer group and he pulled him aside and he says, uh, John, does it pay to meet at the church every day to pray? I mean, the, the gist of the, the question was this. Um, we're not getting any answers. We're not seeing results. We're, the, the effort seems to go nowhere and we're even kind of taking hits. So is it worth it? Is it worth investing our time in this? Does it really pay to pray? And I kind of want you to think about that for a minute. Kind of hit pause and, and just reflect on that for a moment or two. What if you pray and you don't get answers? Uh, or what if the answer you get isn't the one that you wanted? You know, was your praying a waste of time? Uh, and if not, why wasn't it? Just pause real briefly and hold on to those thoughts because we're going to circle back there at the end of our little conversation together today. So again, does it pay to pray? That question puts prayer in the realm of kind of what I call a transactional relationship. Sort of like we put in our, our prayer coin and we get something back. Uh, like a vending machine or something. Um, we select Snickers, right? And what you expect to pop out is Snickers, not Cheetos. And you certainly, when you put your coin in, you don't expect to get nothing. You're supposed to get what you put in for. And so, if the unspoken foundation of our thinking is this praying thing we're doing is some sort of a transactional relationship between God and us, and we don't get what we wanted, or worse, our hands up being, ends up being empty, we start asking that question a whole lot more frequently. Does it pay to pray? Now, what I'm suggesting today is that's the fundamentally wrong question to ask. It's the wrong question to ask because what I'm suggesting today is that, that God looks at prayer fundamentally different way than a, than a this for that transaction. In, in the first talk of this series, I, I introduced the idea of prayer being a conversation with God. And if that's what it is, if prayer is a conversation with God, then doesn't that imply that prayer is more about a relationship than a transaction? I mean, Think of it this way. Do you talk with your friend because you get something from them? In other words, because it pays or because they're your friend? Do you talk with your spouse because you, you get something from them? Or, in other words, because it pays or because you love them? 
I mean, yeah, we ask our friends and our spouses for things, but is that really why we talk to them at a fundamental level? I mean, and is that our only motive for talking to them? If that's our only motive for talking to them, and, and do we stop talking to them if we don't get what we want? Well, if that's the case, then I'd suggest that's a pretty shallow relationship and a pretty superficial relationship. Shallow and superficial. Is that resume building? Or is that something that we need to repent of? See, I believe that God has something much deeper in mind for our relationships, much better in mind, much more fulfilling than just a, a this for that. So if we're in that shallow and superficial spot, I think that's something that we need to repent of. I think we go there maybe way too often. At least I know sometimes I do. So before we move on to, to talk more about what God says about why pray. Um, I'd, I'd like Alex to kind of lead us in a prayer together as, as we repent of how shallow and self-centered sometimes we've made our relationship with God. God, we're sorry. We're sorry for all the times that we've made prayer into something small, into just asking you for the things that we want. We're sorry for all the times that we haven't recognized how much more there is to the relationship and how much more there is to the conversation. Lord, we ask that you help us to see that more and more. Help us to realize the depth of conversation that we can have with you. Lord, help us to come with you for the things that we're thankful for, the things that we're worried about, the times that we're frustrated. Lord, help us to have a fuller relationship with you. We thank you that you give us this opportunity we thank you that, that you're open to have a relationship with us. We thank you that you forgive us. And we thank you that you're patient with us. Amen. So, if from God's perspective, prayer isn't a transaction, then we don't pray because it pays. We pray because, well... Let's look at some of the things that God has to tell us about that, about why we pray. One of the things I notice as I dig into the Bible is that God actually commands us to pray. God actually commands us to pray. Now, are there things, did you ever do things just because your parents told you to do them? Um, your parents say, do this, and you figure it out, yeah, it was a good idea to do what they said. Well, it's taken me a while, but I've finally figured out that that works the same way in our relationship with God. That if God says, do it, it it's a good idea to do it. And that he actually has something good in mind for me if, if, in fact, I do that. And one of the things that God tells us is pray. Uh, several, what you call imperatives, commands on that that says pray, 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 do this. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons, I think, is because God knows that we are so stubbornly independent and that generally we try to do things all by ourselves, even the really big stuff that's way beyond us. Somehow, some way, we always think that we can handle it, even if we can't. I'm kind of remembering back to, to when my kids were young and, and they'd want to do stuff and, and one of their refrains was, I can do it myself. Dad, I can do it myself, even if they really couldn't do it themselves. And I'd sit around and watch, and I'd see the issue, and I'd want them to feel a sense of accomplishment that they could do something, but I'd say, then, well, here, let me help you. And, Dad, I can do it myself. And so I'd sit back, and I'd... And I'd kind of watch, and then, okay, they want to do it themselves, but I say, well, yeah, but why don't you try it this way? Dad, I can do it myself. Well, 
myself ended up messing things up a lot of the time. And I wonder if we treat God that way too sometimes, even with the really big stuff. Yeah, God, this is huge. It's a big problem, I know, but, but I can do it myself. I, I mean, how many times when, when something comes up, isn't, isn't your first reaction, your first thought to engineer your way out of the problem? To say, well, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, maybe that, and if I try that, then perhaps I could do this differently. And somewhere down the line, oh, yeah, maybe I should pray about this. Guilty. All right. Way too much of the time. And as I think about that, I kind of look back and I wonder how much worry and frustration I might have saved myself. If I just, if I did all those same things, but I did them second. If I did them second, and, and my first instinct was simply to stop, drop, and pray. That, that the thing came up and I just said, God, here's what's going on. God, help me. God, show me. God, lead me through this. And I'm wondering if I if I'd done that first, if God might have actually done what he says he wants to do, entered the conversation and, and led me to some possibilities and solutions that, that I didn't think of on my own. That in response to my prayer, God actually would have come alongside and said, here, let me help. And I would have been willing and ready to receive it, I think things probably would have ended up better. And maybe that's one of the reasons that God commands us to pray. I think another one of the reasons is because the command actually gives us the courage to ask. And just like in Psalm 15, 50 verse 15, here, let me read this to you. God said, call upon me in the day of trouble and I'll deliver you and you'll glorify me. There's that command, call upon me. Stop first so that you recognize you can't do it myself. I'm going to help you. I think God's also saying this command is going to give me the courage to ask because, I mean, God's really, really big, right? I mean, he's the, the king of creation, the lord of the universe, the author and giver of life. He holds everything together. And compared to that, we're like, right, really, really small less than the size of a, of a small little bug or a gnat. And, and sometimes that scares us away. Sometimes um, it just says, I'm not even going to approach God. Or it makes us feel like the, the, the stuff's kind of, that we've got is kind of ordinary and small and unimportant. So again, we don't ask. Or we do ask maybe once and then we kind of timidly slink away. Now, what I'm learning about prayer is that God wants us to ask, and he wants us to ask boldly, and he wants us to ask about anything and everything, and whenever it comes up, and wherever it comes up, and from, from the really, really big to the really, really small to everything in between. God wants us to talk to him about all of us, all of it, because he wants to come alongside to help, and he wants us to be persistent, I think. Not to be a sheepish little ask and then drop it, but to keep on asking and asking and asking, kind of like little kids do with their parents, right? Is it, Daddy, can I just once? No, it's, Daddy, can I? Please, Daddy, Daddy, can I, can I, ma, ma, Mommy, please, Mommy, please, 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 Mommy, right? I think that's how, why God commands us to pray. Now, check out this from Luke chapter 18. Verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. I mean, Jesus is saying, I want you to be persistent. I want you to keep coming to me in prayer. I want you not to take that first no for an answer. I love what Martin Luther said more than 500 years ago. Uh, By this command... He makes it clear that he will not cast us out or drive us away, even though we are sinners. He wishes to draw us to himself. I love that phrase. He wishes to draw us to himself. And because he's so big and we're so small, and he does wish to draw us to himself and to not push us away, he commands us to pray out of love and out of love for the relationship and, and from the relationship to, to let us know that he's ready and willing and wanting to help, that God wouldn't have told me to pray if he didn't 
want me to, would he? I mean, here's some other Bible on that. Some Bible that kind of reinforces that command to pray. I want you to write these verses down and jot them on paper, put them in the note field of your phone, whatever it takes to, whatever works best for you, and then look at them this week and, and read them and think about them and think about what they're saying and think about how they apply to your life. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. James chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. If you're with us last week, we talked about how, how prayer is this conversation, and one of the ways God speaks to us is through his word. So if you just write these down and don't look at them during the week, you're not letting God speak to you, speak into your life, speak in that conversation. But I want to encourage you to, to do that. That's kind of like your homework. We're not going to dig any deeper into that today. Uh, your now work is, is to pause uh, this tape for a minute, to pause and reflect, or if you're listening or watching with somebody else, to actually discuss these two questions. I want you to talk about this. What, what does it tell you about God? that the Lord of the universe is not only willing, but he's wanting to talk to you, so much so that he commands you to do it. And the second question is, how does knowing that God commands us to pray give you the confidence to ask God for anything and everything, for big stuff and small stuff and everything in between? Go ahead and talk about that now. Okay, I hope that was a fruitful and helpful discussion. And speaking of that last question, asking for stuff, you know that another reason that we pray, that the Bible tells us we pray, is because of our need. I mean, there's lots of things going on in our lives, aren't there? And some of them might seem rather minor. Stuff that you don't even need to bother God about, that you think maybe he doesn't even want you to bother him about. You know, the, the washing machine's wearing out, or your computer's wearing out, or whatever's wearing out. And, you know, do I just figure it out? Um, or does God want me to actually pray to him about guiding me to the best deal to, to get the new thing that's going to help me? Um, the stress and the strain and the accompanying exhaustion. Uh, do I just figure it out? Do I just figure out a plan for me? Or does, again, does God want me to, to pray about it, to talk to him about it, to ask him to guide me into the right paths? Uh, an upcoming decision. Again, do I just figure it out? That's kind of what I'm wired to do. Just figure all the options and decisions and make my decision. Or does God want me to talk to him about it? Does God want to invite him into the process? Does God want me to pray about it and ask for his direction? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Do you talk to your spouse and your friends about stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, you do, don't you? Well, I think what God's telling us is that he wants in the conversation too, even for the small stuff. And then there's a lot of major stuff, right? There is a lot of major stuff going on. Um, health stuff, financial stuff, COVID-19 stuff, church stuff, the need for protecting and providing for the church, for all sorts of things, uh, leadership stuff, government stuff, racial stuff, um, forgiveness stuff, reconciliation stuff. God wants us to talk to him about that stuff too. God wants us to talk to him about all our stuff. Big stuff, small stuff, everything in between stuff. And, and sometimes, right, sometimes life is so hectic and there's so much of this stuff going on and there's so many needs going on that we don't even hit pause long enough to take a deep breath, 
and to kind of think about those things and list them out and, and talk to Jesus about them. Now, the command reminds us that we need to do that, that we need to hit pause, as, as it were, and, and think about what we specifically need right now in this moment, in this time, and, and pray about it. So let's get ourselves into that space for a minute. That's one thing I want you to do right now. Just, again, hit pause and take a moment to write down your stuff. Wherever it works best for you, a list or on your phone, um, again, write down a list of, of your needs, both big and small, and, and get really specific. What is it that's going on right now? I, I know you could be writing for a really long time. Um, try to take just maybe a minute or two right now and, and, and jot out those most important things that come to mind right now uh, while we're having this discussion. So go ahead and do that and hit pause, and then I'll come back and talk to you again. Okay, you got the list? You got, got the list right there in front of you? Well, here's what you need to understand about the list. Number one, that God's aware of the list. God's aware of the list and Jesus actually understands your predicaments. You also need to understand, number two, that Jesus is actually big enough to help with whatever is on there. And, and third thing is that Jesus wants you to keep talking about it. He wants you to keep talking to about it and, and talk to him about it a lot. That's why you got the list. So, you know, sometimes life is so busy and confusing and hectic that not only don't we stop to talk to him at all, we just kind of collapse. When our mind's on overload, we kind of forget stuff. So, so you can use the list to, to say, Jesus, now here's the stuff on my heart right now. And the fourth thing I want you to understand about the list is that the Bible tells us that prayer actually can and does affect change. Prayer actually changes things. And it's not because we're so powerful or because our faith is so strong or because we've managed to somehow say just the right words in just the right way and get the syllables all right or have just the right posture for praying. Prayer affects change in a way we can't really understand because in a way that we can't really understand, what prayer does is it accesses the power of God. And it not only acts as the power of God, it appeals to the grace of God. That's why prayer changes things, those two things. It accesses the power of God in a way we can't quite understand, and it appeals to the grace of God. Now, putting God things into language that humans can kind of, sort of understand, the Bible talks in several different places about God changing his mind according to his unfailing love. And I think that's why people in the Bible who, who were prayers, they prayed as if their prayers actually could and would change things, that they'd make a difference. And, and a lot of times, they did. I, I think that's what James, one of those guys that hung around Jesus, was trying to tell us in a book he wrote, James chapter 5, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Prayer changes things because God changes things. Now, Alex and I are going to spend a little bit of time talking about that for a little bit. So, Pastor, you're a little older than I am, and I know we just read some of that stuff from the Bible but have you ever seen in your life how prayer actually changes things? You know, Alex, I, I've seen that a lot, sometimes in big ways, sometimes in, in small ones. Probably one of the biggest. I'm, I'm thinking back to w when I was in your position and I was working as a, a, a DCE, a, a, a family minister in, in Dallas, and the pastor we had there, his name was Vern, uh, he was having some problems, and all of a sudden, he 
they went in and checked him out and did some exploratory surgery because they couldn't figure out what the deal was and they just opened him up and closed him up and said um, get things in order you got a couple of weeks there was just cancer all the way through his body and we just as, as the church just was a started praying for him and and people around the country were, were praying for him and they went back a couple weeks later and did another scan and it was completely gone I mean what was what was there was completely there was no no medical reason for that I mean in, in that church there was one of the top four cancer specialists in the whole country he couldn't explain it there no explanation other than God did a miracle you know, and, and what was going to be weeks. I mean, it, it eventually came back years later, a couple of years later. But to have it be there in his whole body and just like gone, what, what explanation is there other than God's people pray? That's absolutely incredible. And I know you told me before launching the church here in Winding Walk, you guys spent a whole lot of time praying. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm sitting up here in the, in the office looking out at what's now built up land and wasn't land uh, it was just land there was nothing built up out here and I remember us praying about even even before we knew we were going to launch the church out here God what would you have us do uh, and the, the, we unanimously uh, voted to, to do this pursue this path I mean to me that's one of those small miracles where, where two or three church people are together sometimes I say there's going to be an argument <laughs> and there and there wasn't. It was like unanimous to do this, even though we didn't know exactly where. And then we prayed for the land, and we couldn't find it, and God found it for us. And, and then we got this the, on the dirt. Who actually spent time? There were people that walked around and, and prayed on the dirt of this land um, for what God would would do here. Um, and I remember before there was ever a building, before we turned a shovel, we had a couple of baptisms on this land uh, and we walked the area and prayed for the neighborhood that was going to be developing and, and now as, as you've seen uh, 10 years later uh, God's really done brought blessing into this neighborhood and, and probably I'll exp I think the biggest thing that I remember is the time when um, we, we got turned down by the Planning Commission they had a big fat no on the conditional use permit for this and our only next step was to appeal to the city council and I think in the history of Chula Vista uh, they'd overturned the planning commission maybe once of the time that I that we could tell and but that that was our only option and so again we pray I remember there were people that were like walking around the the city hall where the council meeting was going to be uh, that night and again no other reason than God and, and God's people praying and uh, we had not only a reversal, but a unanimous reversal. The city council voted unanimously to say, no, this this church needs to be here. And I'm just like, yay God. Yeah, that that's amazing. I and mean, we can see the proof right here before us of, of God yeah, intervening. Absolutely. absolutely. So with, with all of the, the coronavirus stuff that's been going on around here, we've spent a lot of time praying. Have you seen any ways that God has answered our prayers? Well, yeah, and... It, and at times it was just like really frustrating to me. I was like, and remember this Job thing? You're like, well, God, how long? How, are, are you hearing? Are you are you listening? But we kept praying. And first was for that uh, that CARES Act, and we said, God, God, please uh, provide, uh, protect the church, and provide for the church, and provide for the people. And and we didn't get it, and we didn't get it, and we didn't get it. And it's like the last moment, and our, our church savings are, are about gone, and then boom. There it comes. Um, uh, to me, that's a that's a response of God to prayer. Um, and, and most recently, we've been praying. Uh, you know, government is bureaucratic. I, I suppose uh, it moves really slowly, and and there've been a lot of rules that, from the preschool standpoint, really didn't seem to make a lot of sense. But we need to abide by them, and we keep praying. God, we want people to be safe. Uh, but would you please? Help common sense prevail. Um, open up the, the regulations to, to 
to make it easier to both bring back the people that we've had, all the people we've had, and, and to um, provide for even more and to do it in a way that doesn't you know, bankrupt us. And, and no change, no change, no change. And we kept praying, we kept praying, we kept praying. And, you know, just this week, um, looks like there's a little bit of movement, a little bit of movement in the right direction, a little bit of things opening up. And again, all I chalked it up to is God's people pray and, and God listen. That's, again, that's just amazing. And, and we can see time and time again in situations like this where, where God responds to prayer. And it's not always in the time that we think it should be. It's not always in the way that we think it should be. But we can see that God responds to prayer. And especially when we have an enemy, the devil, that's always trying to pull us away from God, to, to seek out and kill and destroy. God steps in and intervenes and goes, no, not this time. And, and we believe in a God that, that responds to prayer, that changes things. The creator of the universe has the power to do anything, yeah. and that is why we pray. We've talked some about how when there's a need, because we believe that God answers prayer and that prayer changes things, that, that we pray about our needs. Well, we apply that same thing, the Bible says, to, to seeing a need in others. Uh, something that grabs our heart and, and just won't let go. Perhaps it's something in our community, in, in our country, in our world that desperately needs to change. Uh, but it's such a big problem that little old me really can't do anything about it. We think there's nothing that we can do until we remember we've got a big God who listens to us, who can change things, and, and who answers prayer. And so we pray. And out of those prayers, then we act. Here's a quote from a book I read in this week from Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. If we genuinely love people, we desire for them far more than is within our power to give. And that will cause us to pray. The inner sense of compassion is one of the clearest indications that this is a prayer project for you. That's what struck me in that quote, that uh, it's our, our, our compassion that for others that moves us to pray. It's not like something that grabs hold of our heart. And that the thing that grabs hold of our heart is the prayer project for you. I could pray about every need in the world, but I think God's saying specifically, there's so much going on in the world right now. Pray about the thing, that burden that's on your heart. So ask yourself, what's the burden on my heart? What's grabbing hold of me and, and, and won't let go? What's the big thing that I feel my compassion flowing for right now? Something that you want to change but seem powerless to be able to change it. Well, we'll write that down and then pray about it daily. That's your prayer project. I think Foster's right. That's your prayer project. It might be racism or poverty or injustice or... COVID-19 or the government or whatever. That's your prayer project, wherever your compassion is leading you towards. So pray about that daily. There are some things that only God can change for the better. I was reminded of that when I read my verse of the day from you version this morning. Psalm 121, starting at verse 1. I look to the mountains... Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There's some things that only God can change, but your heart has a compassion for. So pray about that stuff. So let's, let's kind of pull that together now about where we've been and where we're going by watching this little video clip. What is prayer? Stale tradition? Ritual? A good luck charm? Part of some religious checklist? Done to appease a higher being so we can get what we want? Or at least avoid the lightning bolt? Prayer has been 
redefined and twisted and confused. But at its essence, prayer is simply talking to God, the God who spoke the universe into creation, who gives us life and breath, who holds all things together. This God wants us to talk to him in the vastness of all that exists. He actually cares about us personally, individually. How can we not pray to such a loving God? Wherever we are, how can we not thank him for what he's done or cry out when we need help, when we need forgiveness, when we're afraid, when we give thanks for our blessing or question where our next meal will come from? Why would we live a life apart from him? It's not about formula. How could any posture or well-chosen word impress the author of time and space? It's simple obedience. God has made himself available to us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to trust in him, to acknowledge our dependence on him, to draw near to the one who loved us first. Approaching with confidence, because Christ has torn away the veil. He's washed away the sin that kept us from his presence. And we live in relationship with our Lord. And so we ask that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth and in our lives as it is in heaven. That is prayer. So Alex, we've been talking today about why pray and how God wants the answer to be much deeper than, well, because it pays. Uh, I'm wondering as you watch that little video, if, is there something there that helped you answer that question, why pray? Yeah, I mean, one line that I, I took away from that video that just hit me was, you know, we, we see this amazing, powerful loving God and why would we ever live a life apart from him I mean if if prayer is talking to God I think about the people in my life if I were to just not talk to them my life would be so much less fulfilled and the relationship would deteriorate I mean having having conversations with people is just essential to relationships well that really strikes me you're talking about Again, prayer, well, last week we talked as a conversation. This week you're saying it's a relationship and that I, I, I need to express myself in it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, hi. you're a young guy, but through the course of the years, your, your understanding of prayer has probably changed a little bit. Can you kind of sh share that with us? Maybe. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I can look back at times in my life where I looked at prayer as just going to the genie in the bottle and asking for something, you know, or, or writing my wish list to Santa Claus. Um, but as, a, as I've matured, as I've grown older, I've, I've come to see it more and more like how we've been talking about uh, being in a relationship, having a conversation with God. Um, and now it's, it's much more than just going to God with asks and wants. It's, it's coming to God and thanking him for, for ways that he's blessed me and blessed those around me. Uh, it's coming in and lamenting, you know, telling him the, the things that hurt, the things that make me sad, and and also just asking for, for intervention, you know, and, and things that are going on in our country and our community and, and our relationships. It's, it's matured to just more than God give me. <laughs> you know, and Alex, as you, as you mentioned that word matured, it makes me think, are, are there any specific insights that you're saying, yeah, I, I, I just really want you guys to, to grab this because it really helped me? Just just looking at prayer as as this conversation, as this relationship, think, think for a minute how you interact with people in your life. Think about your loved ones, your your parents, your siblings, your your spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, and you know, if your entire relationship is built around, please give me this, 
where does the relationship go? But if your conversations are, are more than that, if you talk about all the different things, your relationship flourishes into to what you see with you and your loved ones. And so I, my one insight to take away from this is to, to look at prayer the same way that you look at conversing with, with the people in your life that you care about. Alex, thanks. That's, that's really, really helpful to me. I hope it is to the rest of you guys, too. We're going to go ahead and circle back to where we started this whole conversation at the beginning today. So I started our conversation together today by posing the question, does it pay to pray? And I asked you to kind of hold that in your mind as you were thinking about things like, well, what if you don't get answers? And what if those answers are different than the answers that you wanted? Um, was your praying then a waste of time? If not, then why not? And in our conversation together, I said I'd come back to that because we kind of explored some ways that God looks at this whole relationship with us. I mean, a lot of people look at prayer as sort of a transaction. Uh, this for that between me and God. And what we found today is that God looks at it differently than that. That, that Jesus looks at prayer fundamentally differently and, and much deeper. See, the Bible tells us that we don't talk to Jesus just to get something from him, and we don't stop talking to him if we don't get what we want. That'd be kind of shallow and superficial and self-centered, wouldn't it? And relationships that are shallow and superficial and self-centered, they don't work really well. They don't last really long. They, they implode. And that's not what God wants for us. That's not what God wants for us at all. God, God wants to be close to us. God wants to be close to us. He wants to make himself available to us. He wants a, a deep and, yes, a very personal relationship with us. And Jesus gave his life to make that possible. One of Jesus' friends, John, wrote, We love because he first loved us because he gave himself for us and made it possible for us to have a relationship with him. That's why we can love God and that's why we can love each other. So, so fundamentally, the reason that we pray, the reason that we have these conversations with God can be summed up in one word, relationship. Not transaction, relationship, relationship, relationship. A relationship that God made us for in the first place. A relationship that Jesus reestablished by his death and resurrection on the cross. Relationship, relationship, relationship. A relationship, a personal relationship that God desires so much that he actually tells us, talk to me. He commands us to, to pray, to have these conversations. And he tells us that he wants to hear our needs and that he wants to help us with those needs. And he shows us that prayer actually is effective, that prayer changes things. And we've talked about ways that it does. But get this, even if it didn't, even if that didn't happen, even if prayer didn't change things, we'd still pray. We'd still talk to God. We still have these conversations. You know why? Relationship. Relationship. I mean, think of it this way. At the end of the day, even if your, your friend can't give you what you want, even if they're not able to, to meet the need that you have, why do you still talk to them? Because you have a relationship. Because they're your friend. Why do you, at the end of the day, talk to your parent, to your grandparent? Because you have a relationship. Why do you talk to your spouse? Again, at the end of the day, because you have a relationship. It's out of love. So why do you talk to God? Why do you pray, in other words? Because of the relationship. 
because you're in a relationship, a personal relationship with a personal God. See, prayer is a conversation. I really believe that it is. And if prayer is a conversation, that means that we do have a relationship with God. A, a God who wants to hear from us, a God who wants to talk to us, a God who makes himself available to us, a God who wants to be in the same space as us, a, a God who wants us to share stuff with him, a God who wants to come to him for help, a, a God who wants us to enjoy this me and God thing that we're in. I mean, more and more I'm beginning to understand what, what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5. When talking about the relationship between Jesus and the church, he talked about the church as being the bride of Christ. And I think what he's trying to let us know here is that, that Jesus loves us deeply. Uh, that, that Jesus wants to be connected to us closely. That Jesus desires a relationship that's intimate, not shallow or superficial. And that Jesus wants that relationship to grow deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper over time, just like a marriage can and does. And one of the ways that happens is by talking, right? By having conversations, both verbal and nonverbal. Conversations uh, where sometimes we've got the space that we're just hanging out with each other. I mean, think about it. Isn't that really how you got to know your spouse in the first place? conversations and hanging out and isn't that what helped you see who they were on the inside right conversations and and hanging out and isn't that what made you fall deeper and deeper in love with them those things you found in those conversations and in, in hanging out and isn't that what took your relationship to a deeper and deeper and deeper level continuing over time to have more conversations and, and, and hanging out. I, I know, uh, you know what, if Michelle and I had stopped really having much of conversations 33 years ago, uh, our relationship wouldn't be nearly the depth that it is now, would it? I think not. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. And that's the way it works in our relationship with God. And, and one more thing about these conversations. Um, it's conversations that, that help you as, and then hanging out that help you not only to learn more about your spouse, that's important, they also help you to see deeper and deeper into their heart and even into their soul. And, and you'll also find this, that, that sometimes life's just really hard, right? There's a lot of stuff going on, and in those times, it's the relationship. It's, it's the, the conversations and, and the hanging out that, you know, can just kind of calm you down and can still your soul and can make you feel safe and secure and loved and so you're able to maybe rest even while all the mess is still there and your prayers don't seem to be answered and all the mess is going on. You're still okay because you're resting in the relationship. Well, if that's the way it works with us, how much more so God? How much more with God? So bottom line today, here's why we pray. We pray because of the relationship. And we pray from the relationship. When we pray out of love for the relationship, that's why we pray. What are you going to build into your life this week to help you deepen that relationship a little more? We believe that everything that we do, every good thing that we do, every gift that we give, every financial gift that we give, is something that's a response. It's not something that we do to earn God's favor. God has already in grace given us everything. We believe that our gifts are a response. If you are a part of the Concordia community, uh, whether it's our online campus uh, that's throughout the country, 
or whether you're on our campus on location. Uh, think about in this moment as we sing, what shall I render to the Lord? What your gifts are to God, what your response is of time, of talent, and of, of your financial gifts. There are several different ways to do that. Uh, our website is, is very secure. Uh, an online giving portal through our app is, is very secure. You can have your bank do that. Um, any of those responses are all what you're giving to God first. If this is your first time checking in on our online campus today or on our campus on site, don't feel any obligation to give. Just consider as we sing this song how much God has given you. And, and does God want your life to be a response to him? We sing, what shall I render? <laughs> kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We began our worship gathering in God's name. We end our worship time together leaving with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our worship together concludes today by the singing of a final hymn.
are very glad you were able to join us for worship this morning. If this is your first time, please let us know you were here. Text the word NEW ONLINE to 619-493-4001. Concordia loves to pray for the needs of people and the world. Please add your prayer needs to our list by texting the word PRAYER to 619-493-4001. You can leave your prayer need there. Thank you.